In 1919, Yorktown, Virginia was on the verge of losing its history. Of the historic buildings that were still standing, many looked like this. The Revolutionary War battlefields, site of the historic surrender of Lord Cornwallis to General Washington, were already home to a golf course. Developers were eyeing the property for commercial use. And now, 50 years after the Civil War ravaged this town for a second time, the area did not draw visitors. But that would all soon change. Armed with passion and connections, this woman committed herself to restoring historical interest in Yorktown. From the preservation of the Revolutionary War battlefields, to honoring the French troops who gave their lives for our freedom, to establishing an annual celebration of Yorktown Day, and to recognizing the importance of historic preservation. This Yankee had an incredible impact on this small southern town. And this is her story, our founding regent, Mrs. Emma Meek Chenoweth. Emma Leake was born just before the outbreak of the War Between the States on Tuesday, February 12, 1861. She was raised in the small manufacturing town of Millville, New Jersey. Her father was a merchant. Charles Garrison Leake descended from Captain William Garrison, who served in the Revolutionary War. Her mother, Mary Page Lore, came from a family of mill owners. Mary's grandfather, David Page Sr., was also a revolutionary patriot. Emma attended boarding school at Ivy Hall Seminary for Girls. She then attended Millville Public High School. Later, she moved to Philadelphia where she attended the newly formed Neff College of Oratory. Her younger sister, Beulah, went with her. Upon their return from Philadelphia, Emma and Beulah lived with their parents in the Leake Homestead on North High Street. In 1893, 32-year-old Emma was living at home with her family. In what would later become a pivotal move, Emma became a member of the National Society Daughters of the American Revolution. Just four years after the DAR was founded, Miss Emma Leake proved her lineage to Captains Page and Garrison and was given the national number of 6311. She was very proud to note that Letitia Green Stevenson, then the NSDAR President General, signed her papers. Mrs. Stevenson was the wife of the Vice President of the United States, Adlai Stevenson I. And while she was busy with her civic pursuits, Emma's personal life would significantly change. By the beginning of 1898, both her mother and father had passed away. And on August 31st of that year, Emma got married. She was 37 years old. George Durbin Chenoweth was a railroad engineer and 14 years Emma's senior. Born in Warrenton, Virginia, George graduated from Dickinson College and had also studied engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. George began his career in the Western Territories, working as an assistant engineer in the Rocky Mountain Division of the Northern Pacific Railroad. This assignment wasn't easy. While surveying for a new railroad in Montana, George's crew needed army escorts. It seemed the Indians were not as enthralled with the railroad as they were. In 1883, he moved back east to safer territory and worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. In 1900, the newlyweds were renting a home at 148 Maple Street in Woodbury. That same year, a week after Emma's 39th birthday, her sister Beulah died at age 36. Emma's immediate family was gone. A few years later, the Chenoweths were homeowners. Emma and George moved to 214 Cooper Street in a beautiful three-story brick home pictured on the left of this penny postcard from the time period. Life was good for the Chenoweths. 
In 1910, they had two live-in servants, 40-year-old Sidney Smith and his 26-year-old wife, Josephine. George continued to work for the railroad, and Emma continued to be civically minded. Emma's biography appears in the 1914 publication, Women's Who's Who of America. In addition to DAR, she was active with the Methodist Church, the Red Cross, and the Woodbury Reading and Fortnightly Clubs. Emma was also the Vice President of the New Jersey State Federation of Women's Clubs. And in response to the Times, she was noted as being in favor of a woman's right to vote. George was also busy. Elected as city councilman, he engaged in completing a new sewer system and paving the streets. In 1912, he received an honorary doctorate from his alma mater, Dickinson College, for whom he served as trustee for 30 years. George was a member of the National Geographic Society, the Masonic Order, the Sons of the American Revolution, and Phi Beta Kappa. During this time, George retired from the railroad. It was then that things turned difficult for the Chenoweths. Court documents show that they had two mortgages on their Cooper Street home. Lawsuits were filed between the mortgage holders, calling the Chenoweths in to testify. In the end, the home was put up for auction and sold out from under them for $2,000. The property was valued at 10 times as much. After the dust settled, the Chenoweths were left with nothing. In the summer of 1919, Mr. and Mrs. George Chenoweth relocated south. Heading back into the workforce, George was appointed by President Woodrow Wilson as a civil engineer at the U.S. Naval Mine Depot in New Yorktown. They took up residence in the Yorktown Hotel. Those who knew them said they came with little more than the clothes on their backs. Emma was 58 years old, George was 72. Developers in Yorktown were considering a resort hotel and the expansion of the current golf course on the site of the historic surrender of British troops. The National Society Daughters of the American Revolution caught wind of this and rallied their own troops. Daughter Emma Chenoweth would find herself front and center of a national issue. Lucy Leavenworth Wilder Morris of Minnesota was the NSDAR chairman of Historic Spots. She was also the only female appointed by the War Department to serve on the Commission for National Military Parks. She came to Yorktown to survey the scene and found, ironically, that there was no NSDAR chapter in the town that saw the end of the revolution. Mrs. Morris called on her old friend, Emma Chenoweth. Mrs. Morris pressed upon Mrs. Chenoweth to consider forming a chapter in Yorktown to both honor the site of the end of the American Revolution and to support her cause in protecting the battlefields. She put forth in very plain terms the solemn duty owed both the people of Yorktown and the society of the DAR as a daughter of over 25 years standing in engaging in the work. One year later, Virginia State Regent Mrs. Kate Waller Barrett came with Mrs. Morris and her entourage to Yorktown. Again, the pleas for a chapter were extended to Mrs. Chenoweth, but this time she was ready. After considering the matter for some time and the urgent request of the national officers, it appears to be my duty to take up the work of an organizing chapter in Yorktown. I am pleased to accept the duties. I am intensely interested in Yorktown, its history, and its future destiny. On the first Friday in February of 1922, the Comte de Grasse chapter in Yorktown was organized at the Yorktown Hotel. Mrs. Chenoweth was elected regent. She would hold this position for 25 years. Mrs. Chenoweth's priority as regent 
was to raise awareness of the historic significance of Yorktown, despite its shortcomings. She began her regency by making sure the Virginia daughters learned their history. She invited State Regent Barrett to hold the 26th State Conference in Yorktown. Over 100 daughters came to the conference at the York County Courthouse and enjoyed the hospitality of the Comte de Grasse chapter. The conference would cost $500, so the members got to work to raise the funds. They held a cake sale and a pie sale. But more ambitiously, they negotiated with Harper Brothers Publishing to republish the 1881 book, The Yorktown Campaign. The books arrived in time for the conference and sold for $2 each. Not coincidentally, Mrs. Chenoweth held the DAR State Conference in October on Yorktown Day. Under her leadership, the Comte de Grasse chapter initiated the first wreath-laying ceremony at the Victory Monument in 1922. It's a tradition that continues to this day. Mrs. Chenoweth chose to name her DAR chapter after the French Admiral Comte de Grasse. She considered Comte de Grasse the forgotten man and felt that his pivotal role in the winning of the revolution was often dismissed among greats like Rochambeau, Lafayette, and Washington. And she had a strong admiration for the French soldiers who died for a country that was not their own. Her chapter members researched the graves of the French soldiers long forgotten in the area once called Wayne's Woods. In 1924, this land was privately owned and the soldiers' graves unmarked and seemingly lost forever. The Comte de Grasse chapter successfully negotiated with the property's owners to locate these graves and mark the spot for posterity. A large white cross was erected and dedicated to the memory of those French soldiers who gave their lives for our freedom. The cross still stands. Built about 1720 by Richard Ambler, the Custom House had originally been a storehouse for goods that came into the colonies. In recent years, the building had been used as a barbershop, a doctor's office, a school, military barracks, private residences, and a bank. For years, it had stood vacant, its windows broken, its roof leaking, its interior damaged. It had survived the ravages of two wars, but time had clearly taken its toll. Mrs. Chenoweth took an interest. The chief charm to me is that this old building was already one long associated with this country at the time of the surrender, and certainly all those great men so prominent in the history, not only of this country, but of France and England and other countries, were in this building at one time or the other. Fortunately for Mrs. Chenoweth, her friend shared the same interest. Mrs. Adele Matheson Blow lived next door to the Custom House. She and her husband, George Preston Blow, had recently renovated the Thomas Nelson House. Mrs. Blow purchased the Custom House property for $10,000 in 1922. She agreed to sell the property to the Comte de Grasse chapter for the reduced fee of $6,000. All the ladies had to do now was raise the money. Mrs. Chenoweth turned to her fellow daughters for help. DAR members and chapters were asked to donate, and contributions came in from across the United States. Their efforts paid off. On April 24, 1924, the Comte de Grasse chapter purchased the Custom House. Minutes from that meeting state that the building was to be used as a chapter house and would include a museum for the collection and proper care of documents and rare treasures. In 
but the building was still a complete mess. Five years later, Mrs. Letitia Pate Whitehead Evans, a relative of our first vice regent and a friend of Mrs. Chenoweth's, became interested in the project. In a letter to her friend, Mrs. Chenoweth stated her concerns. The building is deteriorating very rapidly and has so bravely survived war and storm for 222 years. Always a notable and historic landmark in the heart of Yorktown and thus rendering it so important that the building be restored and preserved to posterity. Through Mrs. Evans' generous financial contribution, architect Duncan Lee of Richmond and contractor E.C. Wilkinson were hired to renovate the Custom House. Work on the project began June 1, 1929 and lasted one and a half years. The long-awaited dedication of the Custom House took place on November 15, 1930. The gala event brought many notables to Yorktown who were invited by card only. Governor Pollard of Virginia spoke at the ceremony. What a remarkable day for Mrs. Chenoweth. But she held a great sadness. Just a month before the celebration, Emma said goodbye to her husband of 32 years. On October 3, 1930, George Durbin Chenoweth passed away. Having established herself as an important figure in her adopted hometown, Mrs. Chenoweth was appointed by Governor Harry Byrd to be one of two women on the Yorktown Sesquicentennial Committee. Her personal mission was to recognize the French. She worked with the local SAR chapter to place a tablet in Yorktown commemorating her forgotten man. It hangs today in the Custom House. She worked with Mrs. Morris, Mrs. Evans, and other NSDAR members to secure National's commitment to place two more tablets. Only these would go at the base of the Victory Monument. One tablet honors the names of the Patriots who died during the Battle of Yorktown. The other lists the names of the French. Another battle begun in Yorktown had also ended in victory. Just the year before, President Hoover established the Colonial National Monument to include the Yorktown battlefields. Mrs. Morris's campaign was finally a success. About the same time that the Chenoweths moved to Yorktown in 1919, another northerner arrived as well. Mrs. Helen Longyear Paul came from Marquette, Michigan along with her husband Carol. Helen and Emma became lifelong friends. With no children of her own, Emma took to referring to Helen as her niece. Helen referred to her as Aunt Emma. In 1921, Mrs. Paul purchased and renovated what is now known as the Cole Diggs House. Her generosity extended to her Aunt Emma. In 1925, Emma and George Chenoweth moved in. In 1946, Helen sold the property to Mrs. Catherine Blow. Mrs. Blow was the daughter-in-law to the late Adele Blow, who had purchased the Custom House. She was also a dear friend of Mrs. Chenoweth. Now 85 years old, Mrs. Chenoweth had been living at the Diggs house for over 20 years. She would remain there until her death. 
Mrs. Chenoweth's tireless crusade to draw attention to France's contribution to the siege of Yorktown eventually drew attention to her. In 1934, the French government presented her with the prestigious Medal Office d'Academy. This small purple ribbon was Mrs. Chenoweth's most prized award. In 1937, the Virginia Daughters also honored Mrs. Chenoweth. She was asked many times to serve as a state officer, but the 76-year-old politely declined. I have all I can do to attend to the duties of my chapter. NSDAR President General Mrs. Pouch was a lifelong friend of Mrs. Chenoweth's. In one of their last letters, Mrs. Pouch wrote to her, What a glorious life you have had, and what joy you have given to your countless friends. Everyone loves you so dearly. A few months later, Emma Leek Chenoweth passed away at the age of 90. After 21 years without him, Emma Leek Chenoweth rejoined her husband at Lebanon Church on Yorktown Road. She was called a leading figure among those who sought to place the Virginia Peninsula, particularly Yorktown, in the true historical light in which it belongs. In her final report as regent of the Comte de Grasse chapter, Mrs. Chenoweth said, the main objectives of our chapter have been to arouse interest in Yorktown and its historic significance. Much along these lines have been accomplished, however much more could be achieved. The observance of Yorktown Day, I trust, will always be sponsored by the chapter, and the preservation and upkeep of our shrine, the Custom House. The Comte de Grasse chapter has kept her wishes ever since. <laughs>